Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. We are back from Athens where we were able to stand up to an onslaught of tear gas from provocateurs. What's a provocateur? That's a cop dressed up like an anarchist. Hey, Stacey Herbert, what's happening? Max, in fact, I believe they were IMF agents dressed up as anarchists and they were, the tear gas canisters had a CDS written along the side. Collateralized debt swap on a tear gas canister? That is financial terrorism. I think it's called credit default swap. All right, I'll go with that. <laughs> there are so many different names for these derivatives these days. And that's actually the big topic of the day is all the debt circulating around the economy. But first, I, I want to show you this little image because we returned from Greece bearing gifts. And this is artwork, Colonel Papandreou. The people love me. Those who are causing all the trouble are terrorists. The people hate them. You know, they're outside of the uh, parliament building and screaming, thieves, thieves, brothel, brothel. The people in Greece hate the parliamentarians. They hate George Papadreos. I notice you're showing him the palm of your hand. I'm showing him the palm <laughs> of my hand. This is for you, George. Take that. <laughs> Little George, as they call him. So, well, the IMF um, is in the news, and you were speaking to the crowds in St. Thomas Square, Constitution Square, and you told them that after Greece would come the U.S. That's and right. lo and behold, in our first headline, IMF downgrades U.S. After raping and pillaging much of the world, the IMF bankers come home to smash and grab what they can from America. I was in Constitution Square speaking to hundreds of folks gathered the day after the big tear gas festival. And I told them, point blank, in my own self-interest, the people of Greece need to stand up to financial terrorism because Greece goes down, Ireland goes down, Portugal goes down, Spain goes down, and they're going to come to the U.S. The U.S. is going down by the same financial terror. So please, people of Greece, don't let Papadreos and those nincompoops in your country steal all of your wealth. Well, remember, as this article describes the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, they are the global lender. They're a lender, so they're pushing debt. That's the product they push onto people. So in fact, they're warning the US that a gross domestic product would grow an anemic 2.5% this year and 2.7% in 2012. Of course, those numbers are fake yeah, anyway. That's right, that's right. The GDP numbers are cooked, they're fake. You can't get growth by increasing the debt. You could fake it for decades. It, you know, for every dollar in debt, they created a dollar GDP after World War II. And that uh, has been going downhill ever since. Now it takes six, seven, eight dollars of debt to create one dollar of GDP. But at some point it becomes like blood transfusions. You could say technically the patient has a pulse, but that's completely due to the transfusion of the blood. Uh, you're not really alive. They're on the table, there's blood circulating, but the patient is in fact dead. But here's the IMF warning America that they've got to get their debt situation in, under control. And remember, only a few years ago, uh, 2006, 2007, the IMF was bankrupt itself and they were a, a, out of business. Stop, uh, stop, <laughs> stop right there. Let's digress a bit about this IMF situation. They are completely bankrupt. That's why they go into a country like Greece. They take Greece's assets. They use that as collateral to borrow money from other corrupt bankers to take over Greece. But what the IMF is doing now is pulling a Hank Paulson on a global scale. But these these guys are just a construct, an artificial construct out of nowhere. They hold up the world economy and, and act like we owe them money and people pay them and it seems to work because who are they? Who are these people? Just go away. That's what you have to tell them because right now they're saying the problem, why they're threatening the U.S. is because the, um, the political drama going on where the Republicans are refusing to raise the debt ceiling and they have to do this by August, early August. And, and the IMF warns you cannot afford to have a world economy where these important decisions are postponed because you're really playing with fire. Well, there we go again putting a gun to people's head and saying, make a decision quick, 
You know, give us your money or your life. It's a stick up. They can't just keep saying this over and over again, claiming this is the emergency, give us all your money. At some point, you actually have to step in with some legislation, some kind of government functionality. You've got to actually have a functioning economy. You just can't have bandits at the IMF constantly holding people up and saying, we need another trillion dollars. Well, the, actually, they're not even actually demanding any real wealth. What they are demanding the American people do is they're not saying, you guys need to do something to sort out your GDP growth, to build real wages and real wealth and real productivity. They're saying, increase your debt ceiling. That's what we want you to do. And if you do that, then we will no longer downgrade you. So all they want is more debt onto the American population. It's a topsy-turvy Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass Fakakta nightmare, where the IMF is saying the path to economic glory is by increasing your debt ceiling. Hey, IMF, fungal! <laughs> well, okay, so the IMF is now threatening U.S. politicians, but let's look at what the U.S. consumer stroke citizen, what their position is in. How zombie U.S. consumers menace the world. And that's actually from here. I don't have a picture of the headline to turn to because uh, it's Stephen Roach, and that's in the Financial Times, and it's not online. Hey, you know, talking about zombies and people dead getting a blood transfusion and debt, this is the same thing with these consumers, isn't it? They're just zombie consumers. They're the walking dead. They're shopping, but they're dead. They're dead shopping. Well, this is what he says. The global economy is being hobbled by a new generation of zombies, the economic walking dead. The U.S. consumer is in the early stages of an unprecedented retrenchment. Deleveraging has barely begun, however, he says. The U.S. consumer is only down to 115% of personal income is now debt, down from 130. But it needs to get down to historical averages of 75% of debt to personal income. They've got to continue to deleverage, which means they've got to continue to save, which means they've got to stop shopping. But what do you see there? You see the zombie shopping at Walmart, must buy dog food, must buy plastic crap from China. But he points out that the Fed and the U.S. government are actually causing the zombies. They're keeping the zombies alive. They keep on trying to, like, put electrodes into the zombies and make them go take on more debt, just like the IMF is doing to the U.S. government now, and they're saying, raise your debt ceiling. This is what the Fed and the U.S. government are doing to the consumer, Stephen Roach contends. He, they're just trying to force them to go shopping by keeping low rates and trying to encourage them to get back into the housing market. You know, they're offering all sorts of incentives to go into the housing market. They should install cattle prods into steering wheels of all new General Motors cars. So when you turn on the ignition, you get the huge jolt of electricity and it gets you 100 miles an hour to the nearest shop and you start spending beyond your means wildly. That's what the U.S. economy needs. Actually, you know what they should also do at the same time is have George Bush's voice come on and say, go shopping. <laughs> Standing on the rubble. Remember that? Yeah. After 9-11. Attention shoppers. Don't look behind me at the pile of rubble. Just go back to the store and put your credit cards at risk. Well, so I have these final two headlines regarding the housing market. And as I said, the U.S. Fed and the government are trying to force American consumers to take on more mortgage debt. And the IMF is trying to force them to force those consumers to take on more mortgage debt. Housing crisis worse than Great Depression. Seven shocking facts about the U.S. housing market. Well, number one is Zillow has announced that the average price of a home in the U.S. is about 8% lower than it was a year ago and that it continues to fall about 1% per month. Look, the house price situation is not going to get any better as long as incomes keep <laughs> deteriorating. I just saw an interesting statistic that 1% of Americans own the same wealth as the bottom 90% of Americans and income in America is collapsing because remember the uh, global banksters including the IMF they want income levels in China in America to be about the same which would equal about two thousand dollars a year so America's got a long way to go in terms of income parity which means the house prices are set to crash even Case Schiller index says house prices will crash another 25 percent and I guarantee you after they do crash another 25 percent Case Schiller will come out again and say house prices will crash another 25 percent well as you brought up income I'll go to the next headline on this because this involves income as well and and, and re its relation to housing prices 
When the economy becomes a financial circus based on debt-fueled acrobatics, lessons from the Great Depression Part 34, tracking housing values from 1940 to 2011. And this is Dr. Housing Bubble. And he, he looks at house prices going back to 1940 all the way up to 2000. There was a direct link between house prices and US income. But then from 2000 to 2011, the first time household incomes fell over decades since the Great Depression, we saw the largest housing bubble ever. And then he shows this GDP per capita in the US, and that is in the blue. And then you see the median household income in red. And as you see from 2000 as well, GDP per capita in the US grew straight up. Income went down. That's right. So Americans were earning less and less every year as the housing bubble took off to historic proportions. You've never seen anything like this at all in the United States. That's right. The debt levels increased as income went down. <laughs> yeah. At the top of the cycle, the banks swooped in. They took all the equity out that they had extracted using derivatives. They left the consumer with all the debt. Then Barack Obama was elected president and he came into office and the first thing he did was he matched the wealth confiscation of the creditors by giving them $20 trillion more in bailout money. So they doubled their illegal bets and put the consumer into twice the income impairment by now having hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of debt hanging over their head. And he mentioned circus, Stacey Herbert, and you can't have a circus without a contortionist. And this is what Ben Bernanke does when he gets on TV. He's trying to convince people that the economy is actually not shrinking. And it's, he uses contortionary language, doesn't he? Oh, it's the GDP. It's the, oh, it's a little Don't bit more Don't hit your debt. mic. <laughs> I don't care what Mike says about it. OK, well, Max, finally, and reading on the airplane back here from Athens, I yeah. did read, speaking of Barack Obama and his uh, policies towards America and, and zombies, is um, his biggest uh, campaign contributions come from Exelon, a nuclear energy firm. And there are serious questions about why America is not warning its citizens about the nuclear fallout happening along the upper uh, northwest coast. Yeah, the region. northwest coast citizens are getting uh, fried. Well, they have called hot particles, which are radioactive little particles of cesium and uh, strontium and plutonium f going, falling into their lungs. They're turning these citizens into hot pockets. Did you <laughs> have one of those things? You put them in a the microwave? He, he, Obama's microwaving his own people. Well, it's a population already zombified from toxic debts. Right. And on top of them, you're putting radioactive waste. This is like a genuine situation where you could see real live zombies emerge. Right, real life cancerous zombies in the Pacific Northwest. What is it, like Washington, Oregon? Yeah. Kurt Cobain's already dead, so there's not much Who knows, left. you may see him again soon. He may be coming back. Beautiful. All right, Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Rex. Don't go away, much more coming away, so stay right there. Hi, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. All right, this is a treat. We've got the non-economist's non-economist. Steve Keen, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Good to be back, Max. Now, I say you're a non-economist because, of course, you're known for your classic text, debunking economics, mm -hmm. uh, which you pretty much tear apart all the assumptions mm -hmm. that people have been using to guide them through the past, let's say, post-war era. Mm -hmm. And I would say that if you were a stock, you'd be trading at all-time highs because what you've been saying is that all these classical models don't work and that you have to take a different approach to kind of get a handle on understanding the forces that are shaping the economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's talk about a basket case in the world today, Greece. Mm. Now, I should also mention that you're a professor of economics at the University of uh, Western Sydney, and you're an expert on debt deflation. So clearly in Greece, this is a test case example. Walk us through what's happening. Well. The whole, Greece is an unfortunate instance of what's happening on the whole globe, the whole OECD uh, economies. And the real cause of this has been a huge debt bubble which has been driven by the financial sector that is, knows it can only make money by creating debt, but it has to find a way of persuading us to go get into more debt than we actually want to take on. I use the analogy as a bit like going to a dentist and the dentist wants to take out more teeth because the more teeth you take out, the more money he makes. And you only got one tooth that actually needs to be removed, you know. But he's persuasive, well, if you have more teeth removed, you'll be sexier. 
Mm. You know, so you fall for the more tooth removal. And that's what's happened globally. So we have far more private debt than we should ever have had. And that's what's driving the entire crisis. Now, Greece, I don't know enough about Greece to say that Greece went through the same debt bubble as America or England or Australia or Canada or Portugal or Spain, etc., etc. But they certainly had one of the uh, great uh, purveyors of debt persuading, advising them what to do and hiding their situation to get them into the EEC, the old Goldman Sachs. So we have a crisis caused by too much debt. What's the solution that's put forward by the conventional thinkers? Cut wages. It wasn't high wages that caused the crisis. Right. Okay. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, on this debt mode, uh, keeping this in mind now, of course, uh, one of the big um, pushers of the debt mode, let's say, is Keynes, Keynesian thinking. But it wasn't, it was Keynes was saying that you can go into debt during the slow times, but during the good times, you try to pay down that debt. Well, it's actually Keynes, Keynes was talking about public debt. Yeah. My focus is really what's happened with private debt. Okay. Okay. What you get in reverse is that when you, when you look at a, a, the financial system we're in, it's a system driven by privately created debt, and there's also, which, which therefore creates credit money, but you also have a government system which can create government debt and in the process creates fiat money. So there's two sources of money flowing into the economy. Neoclassical economists, the guys that I pillory in debunking economics, mistakenly believe that the government system controls the private, a bit like a, uh, having a, you know, a centrally controlled system making sure that all the cars move at the right speed on a freeway. In fact, what you've got is rather more like you've got a whole bunch of out-of-control cars being driven by out and centre on too many uh, doses of uh, stimulants and uh, the government's coming along in an ambulance chasing the wreckage. So pri private created credit drives the economy, government money comes along later, and what tends to happen is when there's a private debt crisis, the way that it's manifest is the rate of growth of debt slows down and therefore the growth of the economy slows down. So the government comes in and spends by running a deficit and balances it out. Now, if you had a well-functioning economy, then you'd have you know private debt bouncing along like this and government debt bouncing in the opposite direction. And in my first uh, paper modeling Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, that's precisely what I had happening. What I didn't cover in detail on that paper, though I did cover in a later one in 2000, was that there can be a situation where rather than the private debt doing this and the government debt doing that, you've got the private debt doing this. And so for the government to balance it, it's got to be doing the same thing in the opposite direction. That's after what you have what people have now called a Minsky moment, when so much private debt's been taken on, that the only way out of it is to take on never-ending amounts of public debt as well. So if you go down that route, you know, you've got, this, as Japan has had, private debt that stabilises perhaps at far too high a level, public debt that continues rising, trying to balance the deflationary effect of reducing private debt. The real solution is to say, hey guys, we shouldn't have had this private debt in the first place. If you want to solve the crisis, somehow abolish or reduce the real burden of that private debt. And ironically, the best way to do it, and Keynes made a similar case, though not, as, not quite as frankly as I make it now, is to increase wages. No, we're back not to uh, increase wages. Okay, increase so let's wages. get back. Increase wages. Now, this goes against a lot of the yep. so-called wisdom out there. Mm. So, by increasing wages, you're actually helping to solve the problem. You will then cause inflation. So, Ben Bernanke, uh, ages ago, made this printing press argument that if you have a crisis, it's quite simple for the government to have a run its printing press. That's where he got the helicopter Ben nickname from. And print the money, and that will cause inflation, and everything will be solved. Well, he printed money faster than anybody has ever printed government money on the planet in 2008 and 2000. 2009, literally more than doubling the level of base money in America. And what you had was a, when you went into the crisis, inflation in America was running at about 5%. It fell to minus two, so we had deflation, and then literally more than doubled base money, and inflation went from minus two to plus two, and then started heading down again. So with an enormous injection of money, giving it to the banks, almost nothing in inflation. Some inflation was caused, but certainly not enough to devalue the debt and, and fix the whole crisis up. If you really wanted to co cause inflation and therefore reduce the effective burden of that debt, the way to do it is to increase wages because then firms have got no choice but to increase their prices. Workers have got no choice but to spend because costs have gone up you actually get effective inflation that way. I mean, didn't Henry Ford figure that out? He, he raised the wages of his workers who they could buy the cars. Yeah, yeah, and again, like the Roosevelt, the, a large part of the New Deal was giving decent wages to workers. So when you cut the wages, it looks like it's sensible. This, this is the whole uh, inability to think in the feedback sense that the actual economy operates in. If you cut wages, 
you will therefore have a deflationary impact on the economy when it's already in a deflation. So by driving the price level down, you increase the value in, in real terms of the outstanding debt, making your crisis worse. What you have to do is reduce the value of that debt. And the easiest way is to reverse the trend of the last 40 years, which has been a trend for falling wages, both in real in, in, in terms of the proportion of GDP. So you cause a bit, you, you put the wages up, not to actually get them much larger share of GDP because you're expecting inflation to come along and erode it. But by eroding the, the, by the inflation eroding the value of the debt, you'll drive down the banker's share and that's the section that should be reduced. Why do people who rely on wages for a subsistence don't seem to be arguing this case. And in, in America, for example, yeah. nobody who's, who's a wage earner is out there demanding higher wages. Yeah, because we don't see the complex systems that, that cause the overall economic behavior. Uh, and we tend to think about things in a, in a household fashion. And this is actually where neoclassical economics has been marvelously useful to people who want to screw up the economy. Now, nobody actually really wants to do that, but that's the impact of the theory. Because what it tries to get you to believe is that what applies for you as an individual can be extrapolated to the social level. So if you're in a household and you're running a deficit, you've got to cut back the spending, which means the kids can't buy their Nintendo games anymore. You know, that makes sense. The household ba balancing budget, you've got to do that because you face what I can call a hard budget constraint. Yeah? And that works at your, at your individual level. But you would extrapolate it to the national level. That's not how the national economy functions. We have banks which give us a soft budget constraint. So if you actually run out, if you actually want more spending in the economy, you borrow more money from the banks. And that change in debt stimulates aggregate demand. It's part of aggregate demand. Right, and mm. the borrowing money from the banks mm. on the household level means putting your house up as collateral. So you and put your house up as collateral, mm -hmm. you borrow much, uh, money, you've got the ATM created inflation that in that way. Yeah. But what you're saying is that um, if you step away and just look at the wage earner, mm -hmm. divorced from the household yeah. and the house, yeah. Uh, you get a much clearer picture of the problem and the solution. Well, you, what you see is that what you're talking about there is a positive feedback system because the house prices start to rise or there's extra debt being taken out to buy houses and that means that house prices rise and because they rise people are willing to take out more debt to buy house price, houses. So you get a spiral pushing it up and that's bad debt. That's the sort of debt we shouldn't allow in the system. And, mean, and the wages remain stagnant. Rate right, it remains static. So you've got you know, incomes remaining static debt going up compared to incomes because everybody thinks they're making a profit by buying a house using leverage and in riding the leverage as the house price increases. The really the only people who make money out of houses rising in value over time are real estate agents and banks. Even now though, with the crash in housing and the obvious wealth confiscation yeah. of banks manipulating the system, yeah. people are still not arguing for higher wages. I know, because they're not thinking about what's actually caused the problem. Uh, it's so easy, like at the moment, you'd imagine this whole crisis is caused by a government, uh, government debt. We didn't have a government-induced crisis in 2007. The government debt in America and everywhere else in the world came along afterwards to patch up what actually went wrong with the system. If you want an analogy, it's a bit like having a, a person who's chopped their own arm off and then you put a tourniquet over the arm and the tourniquet is now blamed for the fact that the arm fell off. Right, it's, because it's, there's a huge disconnect now. And there's, yeah. Well, there's vilification, to yeah. be quite yeah. honest. In the yeah. U.S., for example, unions, which are there to hopefully support some kind of wage growth, are mm. vilified as anti-business mm. and anti-growth. The real anti-growth are the bankers. The bankers have given the money for, for, for speculation and not for investment. They don't even finance investment anymore particularly. They certainly don't finance working capital. That's why firms issue. They finance speculation. Yeah, they finance speculation. And we're, we're convinced that that's good. That's nonsense. And when they get in trouble, then they seek bailouts. And they get rescued by and the And then governments. they get austerity measures pushed down to the wage earners. Yeah. So let me ask you, Professor, uh, here's an idea. Uh, if I'm uh, representing wage earners, mm. Um, what about the idea, because typically wage earners will ask for wage increases tied to GDP. But mm. GDP is another one of these economic statistics that mm. you point out in your work, mm. uh, Debunking Economics 1, and the sequel coming out, I believe, this fall, Economics, Debunking Economics Part 2, which is be available soon. Uh, but, Professor, uh, if I came to you in your class and I said, well, wouldn't it be an interesting idea if, let's say, cops and... Uh, firemen and teachers negotiated wage increases not tied to GDP growth, but mm -hmm. tied to money supply growth. That's an interesting one. I hadn't so thought What do I get? Do I get a grade on this? Do you I get a grade on that. That's a good idea. That would, that's, that's sort of, that's, that would stop me in my tracks in my class. You say because 
the money supply growth is how bankers pay themselves. Yeah, yeah they get paid by the, the how much fiat money they inject into the system, and they mm. get a fee based mm. on that. There's I mean, I can see areas where that will actually backfire. Now, that's actually what happened back in 1919 in England, which caused the depression in the beginning of the 20th, the 1920s there, was that the two UC had negotiated a cost of living adjustment. So they actually got cost of living changes, not, not money supplies you're talking about. However, what the government then did is go back on the gold standard, which caused a massive devaluation. And wages had to fall by 20%, and that caused a depression at the beginning of the 20th, 1920s in England. So it can backfire on you. Sure, so unless ECs, you have yeah. gold uh, you know, in the bank, and then you're hedged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, see your head. You see, I have a two-pronged attack. Now uh, we've kind of run out of time, so I want you to tell us final thoughts on the global debt crisis based on what is being prescribed by governments and the IMF. It'll, it'll extend the crisis even further. Austerity is not what Europe needs. If if the private system is not producing the credit, which it won't do in this level of debt, then the government's got to come in and produce money supply to keep growth going over. Rather than austerity, you need prosperity from the public sector, which means, as I said, wage, re wage rises. You've got to reduce the de private debt burden. Anything that doesn't do that is not going to work. All right, Steve Keen, thanks again for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. And I want to thank my guest, Steve Keen, author of the soon-to-be-released Debunking Economics Part 2. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.